This week we're going over foot biomechanics and this is an area that we definitely need to make sure that you know we have on lock when we're going into the MPTE. Super important. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a little bit of my Pablo Picasso today. Make sure I'm drawing out a little bit. All right. You could draw it out on your paper as well to make sure that you understand these major points. All right. Cool. So for this week's clinical file, we have Lucas and Lucas is a healthy 15 year old male that presents with a recent onset of lateral forefoot pain during toe off. And in parentheses, we have pre swing. All right. The patient is likely to demonstrate which of the following compensations during gait. And so we have a forefoot varus, B rear foot eversion, C rear foot inversion, and D is forefoot valgus. All right. Those are our answer choices. So for those of you on the podcast right now, I was just talking to the people live about how it's so important for us to understand foot biomechanics and compensations, especially as it relates to gait, uh, because this is a major area you need to be ready for on the MPTE. And so it'll be my goal today to really break down some of these areas, all right, as we go along. So let's start off at the top. It says Lucas is a healthy 15-year-old male. And that's not the end of the sentence, but let me slow up there. Healthy 15-year-old male. Um, so already it's starting off letting me know that this patient doesn't necessarily have any like major congenital deformities or anything. like. It's not talking about anything like that, right? There was no accident, no trauma. So that's something to keep in mind as I move down the question. Remember, keep these questions on face value, black and white, just what it's telling you. It says healthy. All right. Now it says that Lucas is a healthy 15 year old male that presents with a recent onset of lateral forefoot pain during toe off. And I'm going to underline that piece. Why is it really important? Because notice how it says a recent onset of lateral forefoot pain. All right. But it doesn't give us any type of traumatic event or anything along the lines of that. Remember, we got to keep this very black and white. And so what's coming to mind for me is what should be happening during toe off? I mean, I guess the name gives it to you already, right? That this is the part where we're getting a lot of that propulsion. We're getting the foot off the ground. We're progressing into the swing phase. Where should the majority of your weight be at this point? Right. Think about that. How does gait work? How does pressure work as it moves from the back of the foot? where we get that heel strike, and then we're going into pre-swing. Like, where does that pressure go? And you should be saying it's going over towards the big toe, right? It curls around the lateral side of the foot and, and then goes towards the big toe, and then we push off. Okay, well, here's the thing. It's saying a recent onset of lateral forefoot pain during toe off. Well, if the majority of our pressure should be around the big toe normally, why would the patient ever be having lateral forefoot pain during this phase? They must be putting an excessive amount of stress out there. So that already should be lining you up with a specific type of pathology diagnosis that we're working with. All right. Or structural deformity here. And you should be saying, well, that is what we call the thumbs up position, a.k.a. Forefoot varus. Yeah, put that down in your notes, baby. You might have to slow up the car, stop the treadmill. You got to put that in your notes. And I'll go ahead and draw it out for those of you on the uh, on YouTube right now. All right. You see the big circle is going to be my big toe. All right. Let's say we're dealing with the right foot right now. Those of you on the podcast, think about this. I'm drawing the, the toes of the right foot. You got your big toe that's up in the air. And my little toe on that lateral side. You know, that fifth metatarsal, that's going to be like down on the ground. That's what we call four foot varus, big toe up, little toe down. And I'm putting a lot of stress on the lateral side of the foot. That's what this question is telling me already. All right. Now it says the patient is likely to demonstrate which of the following compensations during gait. So if my patient is presenting with four foot varus, and I'm just going to go ahead and put that down on my notes here, four foot varus, I know that they're dealing with that or the patient's presenting with that. How will I compensate for a four foot varus is really the question. So for those of you on the podcast, let me go through the answer choice again. A says four foot varus. 
All right. Uh, B says rear foot eversion. C says rear foot inversion. And D says forefoot valgus. All right. So let's knock these down one by one. Will my patient compensate for a forefoot varus problem by doing forefoot varus? Does that make sense? Will my patient compensate for a forefoot varus problem by doing more forefoot varus? No, right? We wouldn't see that. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense, right? So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of A. It's not what I would want. Let's look at B. B says rear foot eversion. Hmm. So this is a really important point that I need you to write down in your notes right now. That generally speaking, when we're looking at the foot, all right, the rear foot will tend to go in the opposite direction of your forefoot. All right, when it's trying to compensate. And the reason for that is because we want to keep the foot flat on the ground. We don't want half the foot to be up in the air and the other foot, half of the foot to be down and then putting all the pressure on one side. We don't want that. And so what the rear foot tries to do is go in an opposite direction of the forefoot in order to keep it down on the ground. All right. Does that make sense? So what I need you to write down in your notes is forefoot opposite direction from the rear foot when we're talking about compensations. So let's think back to the case that we had. We have a patient who has four foot varus, big toe up in the air, right? Everybody do this. Even if you're in the car right now with your other foot, you know, put yourself in a four foot varus position where your big toes up in the air. And then how would I get that big toe down? What would the rear foot have to do in order to get the big toe down to the ground? So it would have to evert, right? It would have to go in the opposite direction in order to get that big toe down to the ground. Well, what's the opposite direction called? Rear foot eversion. I absolutely love it. And for those of y'all who need me to draw this out, even if you're on the podcast right now, you could check me out on YouTube for this question. All right. I'm going to go ahead and draw out that calcaneus right now. Okay. And this, this little block here is the calcaneus. And what it's going to look like is the calcaneus is going to swing out this way in order to bring the big toe down to the ground. All right. And so all I'm drawing is the calcaneus going the opposite direction into rear foot eversion in order to bring that big toe down to the ground. That is the type of compensation that we would expect to see. All right. And so A was not correct, but B looks like it's a great answer right now. Let's look at C, though. C says rear foot inversion. See, I don't like this answer. And the reason why I don't is because if you think about it, if we got our big toe up in the air and we do rear foot inversion, now we're really going to be on the lateral side of our foot. Try this out for yourself. Put your big toe up in the air and then imagine yourself doing more rear foot inversion. It's like now you're just walking on the lateral side of your foot. That's not how we would compensate. It's the exact opposite of what I would expect. All right. And so C would not be the right answer here. You know, I may see that uh, happen with someone who maybe has like club foot or has more of a rigid foot from from the, the beginning parts, the forefoot all the way back to the rear foot. I mean, everything was like locked down, like nailed down where everything just moved in the same direction together, then I would see that whole rear foot inversion happen. All right. But since we don't have that in the question, the patient doesn't have any plates in the foot or any nails or anything like that. It's not rigid. So there's no reason for me to believe that the rear foot will go into inversion. It's my bottom line. All right. Can we look at the last answer? We got to make sure that this isn't the right one. So it says D four foot valgus. Now, a lot of people selected this one, and I see why. Because, you know, the patient's coming into you, and they have this four-foot varus during gait, and now you're looking for the compensation, four-foot valgus. I get that. But here's the thing. The four-foot doesn't compensate for itself. That kind of doesn't make sense. Let me, let me give you another perspective on this. All right? Something's completely different. Let's talk about the quads and the knee. 
All right. Sometimes you have patients who will have knee buckling because of weak quads, right? The quads aren't able to keep the knee locked out or knee in extension. And so the patient buckles. Am I right? Well, if I have a patient with weak quads and they're buckling, do the quads compensate for themselves? No, they're weak, right? They need something else to help with the compensation. They don't do it by themselves. Right, so the quads don't compensate for themselves. Same thing in this situation, the forefoot doesn't compensate for the forefoot. That doesn't really make sense here. We need something else to help. And therefore D would not be the answer here, leaving us with our best answer of B as in boy, rear foot eversion. It's a little tricky one. This one's tough. If you want to understand a bit more about foot biomechanics and how it works with gait, I would say Donald Newman, um, Donald or David, I always mix that up. It's either David Newman or Donald Newman. Um, the, your kinesiology textbook is a great textbook to kind of look at. It gives you a lot of those little pointers and special tips uh, to look at this stuff. So that's something I recommend for you, you know, to really get a good understanding. But can I give you a piece of advice? If you want to go into this area, something that's going to save you hours of time, well, here it is. If you want to really study this area, study the things that are normal first. A lot of times what we do is we get so wrapped up in trying to figure out what's pathological and what's abnormal and what, you know, what am I going to potentially see with our patient who's abnormal? And that stuff's great. We do want to get there. But in order for you to have that solid understanding, the retention and application that you're looking for, you have to understand what's normal first. And a lot of us don't understand foot biomechanics from a normal standpoint. We're so quick to be like, okay, let me get through this so I can get to the pathology. Am I right? I know I'm not alone here. So that is my strategy to you. I'm telling you, this will save you hours upon hours of time if you focus on understanding the normal stuff first and then let's progress to the abnormalities. Make sense? All right.